Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's exciting webinar. I am Tim Stark and your host for today's webinar, which is part of an ongoing series of emerging topics in geosynthetics. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by the Fabricated Geomembrane Institute, which is an industry-based organization at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign that promotes the use of fabricated geomembranes and other geosynthetics for a variety of applications through its research, education, and technology transfer activities. Today's webinar is also co-sponsored by the North American chapter of the International Geosynthetic Society, or IGS-NA, I am currently a vice president of the IGSNA and pleased that the IGSNA is also sponsoring our free webinar series. IGSNA's mission is to educate the civil engineering industry about geosynthetics via webinars, educate the educators course, student and professional memberships, and conducting geosynthetics related conferences and workshops. During today's webinar, we welcome questions and comments, which can be typed into the question box in the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will address them at the end of today's presentation. The recording of this webinar and a PDF of all the slides will be made available on the FGI website after today's presentation. PDH certificates will be sent automatically to all who attend the entire webinar. So today's webinar speaker is Elliot Pugh of Wind Defender LLC, who is giving his webinar from Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Elliot Pugh received his bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Widener University near Philadelphia and began working as a project manager and estimator for a general contractor focused on landfill construction. Elliot has spent the last seven years of experience in the landfill industry and is currently the sales man manager for Wind Defender LLC, a geosynthetics company focused on exposed geomembrane cover systems. It is great, Elliot, squeezed us into his busy schedule to give our September 2019 mm -hmm. webinar titled Temporary Landfill Covers, Design and Construction. Please welcome Elliot Pugh. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you, FGI. I appreciate you guys having me on today to do this talk. Um, <clears throat> as Tim said, I'm gonna cover Temporary Landfill Covers, Design and Construction. Uh, maybe a little bit more background on myself. Um, after completing my engineering degree, uh, as I went to work for the earthwork contractor specializing in landfill construction, I really got involved in all the different facets of the landfill industry from lining materials to earthwork to piping to horizontal collection and gas wells. Uh, so it really gave me a nice um, broad knowledge of the industry and how these projects are you know built and the coordination between general contractors and installation contractors and fabrication companies um, all together to uh, make successful projects um, so today i'm really going to focus on ballast systems and exposed geomembrane cover systems um, with the exposed cover systems it's definitely an uh, a trend in the industry. We're seeing more and more of these exposed membranes. I'm going to cover the different applications they're used in, kind of how you should go about deciding which product uh, fits each application best, and also touch on some prefabrication. Um, and then, of course, we're going to cover some ballast systems, um, some of the traditional methods out there, what options you have, and some of the challenges faced with those products and systems. So, first off, um, the three applications you're going to primarily see where exposed membranes are used are cell rain covers, temporary or interim caps, and stockpile covers. Uh, I know most of you are in the industry and familiar with these, but I'll touch quickly on some of the major benefits. Uh, first off, cell rain covers. It's uh, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, whenever you're building a new landfill cell, once the construction of that landfill cell is complete, um, a thin mill membrane could be used to cover the protective cover soil layer. 
Uh, essentially what that uh, thin membrane is doing is segregating any stormwater uh, from leachate. So we all know the second we put um, any trash in a landfill cell and any stormwater or precipitation that comes in contact with that trash needs to be treated as leachate. Um, these cell rain covers are very effective at um, separating those two solutions, leachate from stormwater. Um, a, uh, in addition to that, you also have benefits of erosion control uh, to the underlying protective cover soil layer. Uh, these membranes and ballast systems can be used to protect uh, any underlying geosynthetics from UV damage, as well as uh, improving the runoff quality. Um, so just quickly, the photo you're looking at there is from a power facility. Um, there were about 500 foot long slopes and very steep two to one. Um, quickly, the contractor realized as they were pushing their protective cover soil layer up the slopes, uh, they would have some washouts and uh, were constantly battling keeping that um, protective cover on the steep slope. Um, they needed a way to protect the underlying geocomposite. So uh, prefabricated um, thin mill reinforced membrane was used as a means for UV protection to the geocomposite, and then a windscreen ballast system was placed over top uh, to provide the ballast on that cover. Um, quickly, one of the calculations we do just to see if uh, a rain cover is feasible for your application, uh, it's pretty simple math. You could take a 10 acre open lined area, um, do the calculations to determine how many gallons of um, leachate you would collect annually, and you can input an average disposal cost of 12 cents per gallon, gallon when you're um, an, analyzing this. And essentially, you're coming out with about $1.7 million um, in annual leachate treatment costs. Now, obviously, treatment costs vary from site to site. If you have direct hookup to uh, a sewer and uh, or if you're trucking your solutions off site. Um, so really, I've seen uh, disposal costs anywhere from a penny a gallon upwards to 30 cents a gallon. Um, but if you were to install a 10 acre rain cover supplied and installed rain cover and ballast system, you're looking in the rent ballpark of two to three hundred thousand dollars. <throat> uh, the second common application for these exposed membranes would be uh, temporary covers or interim caps, as they call them. Um, Really, with these exposed cover systems, you're you're getting the same benefits as a final closure system. Um, you're just doing it at a fraction of the cost, and you're eliminating much of the maintenance associated with a traditional final closure, or I should even say a traditional interim cap. Um, by eliminating the soil cover, you're not dealing with erosion issues. Um, you know, having to worry about uh, establishing vegetation cutting your grass and just the continual upkeep with that. Um, you're also eliminating the generation of leachate or greatly reducing it um, by installing these membrane and ballast systems over top of a waste mass. Um, it's a great way to buy your site some time if uh, you know, you're, you're trying to procure funds for a final closure system. We've seen uh, that technique implemented on different projects. Um, and at the end of the day, you're, you're still controlling odors um, and uh, depending on, you know, your, your, your site specific uh, uh, area directly behind this installation to the right side of the photo uh, is a housing development. So odors, um, visibility, aesthetics was a, a really big factor when it came to installing this temporary cover. And lastly, um, your stockpiled materials. Um, right here, you're looking at a, a photo of a clay stockpile. This site in particular um, started sourcing some clay years ago um, and brought in um, a fair amount of clay to be used in the uh, bottom of every one of their cells for the next couple of years. So they needed a way to protect um, that stockpile, obviously, uh, uh, membrane cover was used as well as the windscreen ballast system in this photo. Um, so all of these applications are uh, pretty are, are becoming more and more common um, and they all are in line to use a fabricated membrane. 
uh, they're all great candidates. And with the fabrication technology that's available, uh, they offer a lot of benefits to the site, the installation contractor, um, the engineer, and and really it's it's due to the the way these fabricated panels are uh, put together. You know, they're put together in a controlled environment indoors. They're free from dust and dirt. Um, you know, water, wind, all the factors that you would see in the field and battle as an insulation contractor. Um, essentially, what, what happens is these uh, rolls are welded together in a controlled environment, they're accordion folded, and then they were basically placed on a uh, master roll or a large roll um, and, and wound up. And that will be shipped to your job site, can be put into the exact position where it needs to be to be unrolled and unfolded um, right into the area. So exact fit panels um, definitely cut down a lot on installation time and field seaming. <clears throat> Some of the common membranes you would see in the in a fabricated format would be your reinforced polyethylenes and polypropylenes. Um, really the reason for that reinforcement and what makes it so effective, not only is it increasing the puncture and tear resistance of your membrane, but it also um, helps to provide a longer service life and reduce the thermal expansion and contraction of the, the membrane itself. Um, so for any of you that have been out on a site and saw traditional HDPE membrane, um, it has a, has a tendency to, to wrinkle and expand and contract due to the temperature changes um, because of its high thermal expansion um, coefficient. Uh, what happens when you're when you're seeing this on your landfills is these piping areas or these areas of wrinkles and folds basically can act as uh, piping networks. Um, it serves as a channel for any fluids to flow through. So you're going to get a lot of um, under uh, tunneling of the soil underneath your membrane or water running between your layers of geosynthetics. Um, with the with the expansion and contraction of your traditional HDPE membranes. You know, you're also putting a lot of stress on areas of anchor trenches, seams, any um, areas of grade change or swales. You know, the, the liner has a, the ability to move and it can uh, put a lot of stress on above ground wells, for example. So um, just things to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at the potential for prefabricated panels. So, um, all these temporary or exposed covers are, you know, offer many, uh, many benefits to your site and your clients. Um, it's also one of the most dangerous um, installations um, to ballast. Uh, not only is this rain cover, you know, a very expensive thing to put down or, or exposed membrane, a very expensive thing to install, but you need to protect that investment. Um, so you can see in the photo attached, you know, this is your traditional rope and sandbag system. You can see the line of sandbags. Um, this membrane, you know, was just tore just due to wind um, over time. So I think it's really important to understand what are the two effects that are causing um, this wind damage to the exposed membranes. Uh, essentially, you can break it up into two areas, crosswinds and wind uplift or negative pressure. Uh, crosswind is, much as it sounds, uh, wind blows across an area of an installed membrane, and these small areas of trapped air underneath the liner um, are migrated into one general area, uh, basically causing the membrane to balloon and waiting for a strong enough gust to come and cause it to fail. Um, the second is wind uplift or negative pressure. So many, many people think, or uh, many folks think that um, their liner system is damaged or tears because the wind gets underneath the membrane. Uh, that's not typically the case. In most in installations, your membrane is anchor trenched um, around the entire perimeter of the installation. So there's no area for air to get underneath your membrane. What you're actually seeing happen is the flow of air, typically in areas of grade changes, so on a slope, towards the top of the slope, you'll experience in this uh, negative pressure or suction effect just created by the aerodynamics and the way the wind flows across the slope. Um, so that's really what you're seeing. And over time, that constant wind whip um, will just weaken your material, uh, eventually creating a hole, and then you have a problem. 
<clears throat> so over the years, we've combated this uplift effect uh, in many different ways. Probably your most traditional method is your rope and sandbag system. Um, this is an example on the top left corner of a cell rain cover, a thin mill um, geomembrane installed. And there's no rope lines between these sandbags because they're on the flat floor. But on your slopes, you'll see there is some uh, rope lines which actually suspend those sandbags in place. Um, as you can imagine, over time, your rope lines tend to degrade. Sandbags get pecked apart by birds. Um, and there's a lot of labor that goes into hand filling those sandbags and placing them out in the field. Um, so just a, a tedious process. Um, it's effective, uh, but over time, you know, you, typically in a three-year period, we're seeing some type of sandbag replacement, rope line replacement, um, or some type of repair. Um, you have other options such as tires, uh, soil windrows, and ground anchors. Um, not every site has tires available. Um, definitely an option, again, that's gonna take a lot of manpower to install. Um, and the soil windrows, might not be the best idea to uh, have to get out on top of your lining system uh, to place some soil to ballast it. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the ground anchors, essentially what it is is a like a concrete anchor that you would drive through your lining system into the soil or into the waste below. Um, and then a load plate is placed on top of the, the rod and uh, tensioned um, into place. Over top of that top patch, you would have uh, over top of the anchor, you actually have to install a patch. So you're going to take some grinding and some extrusion welding. Um, and this is typically done, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 foot on center across your installation. Uh, just another photo here of your rope and sandbag system. As I said, with the snow loading um, and UV degradation, typically a lot of failures are occurring on the sloped areas. So you can see where rope lines have snapped. Um, essentially what's happening is the snow is building up on those sandbags and uh, just creating more and more weight uh, over time uh, until your system fails. Um, that's when you're left with the picture on the right of the failed lining system. Um, just a lot of work to come back in there, remove your sandbags, try and replace them um, and repair the lining system. Another thing to note is with uh, Windscreen ballast systems, you know, typical roll sizes, uh, weight of a roll will be around 325 pounds and can cover approximately 6,500 square feet. If you were to cover that same area with your open sandbag system, uh, assuming a five by 10 grid, you're roughly looking at about 4,000 pounds worth of sand that has to be shoveled into the bags, carried out and placed on site. So safety is another uh, a big concern with, uh, with your ballast system installation. So the traditional methods that we covered so far, they all use the same concept, um, essentially put enough weight on your liner system and it'll hold it down. Um, so you can see the photo to the left, uh, this is the most sandbags I've ever seen installed on any exposed membrane um, in the past seven years. Um, and to the right, you'll see a windscreen ballast system. So um, unlike the traditional methods, the way the windscreen systems function is by providing by aerodynamically diffusing that uplift force. Um, so the, the porous nature of the knitted windscreen ballast systems allows it to diffuse and counteract that uplift force. So this next slide um, will be of a short video, just showing again the, uh, the effects and the process of this wind uplift. So the main flow of air comes across the top of your slope and creates that suction effect, which is typically greatest towards the top of the slope. You can see it recirculates the air and as that air feeds back into the main flow, that's the area of the greatest um, negative pressure or uplift. So when wind defenders installed, that, that uplift is still being drawn out of the wind, air is being drawn up and out of the wind defender and from the membrane and it's being replaced by a downward force of air, so essentially canceling out the uplift force. Uh, with the windscreen systems, um, 
it's typical to uh, implement some type of quality assurance uh, measures. So third party testing is done on every um, lot of material. In addition to third party testing, uh, long term UV testing has been conducted on the system, which shows uh, a half life of 55 years and an expected service life of 90 years. Um, in addition to the long term UV testing, uh, dynamic wind testing was done up to 110 miles an hour, showing no damage to the windscreen system and still a 75% reduction in the geomembrane uplift. Uh, as we were speaking with some other engineers um, on a few projects, we've had a, some perimeter basins that were designed on, some, on a few projects that uh, engineers felt they over-designed. Um, they had some 100-year storm events and didn't reach the capacity of the flow in those channels. Um, so they asked us to run some um, runoff testing. Um, so we did some runoff rate testing and found that the windscreen system actually has a Manning's coefficient of 0.029, similar to the Manning's coefficient for grass. So you can understand that the wind, uh, windscreen systems do tend to slow the flow of the water. <clears throat> uh, the material itself is a knitted uh, UV stabilized HDPE textile. So the uh, filaments are HDPE, they're put on a loom and they're knitted together. Um, as you can see in the photos on the right, uh, our, the windscreen system is traditionally green in appearance. Um, recently we have updated kind of the color of the system. So if you can see here, I'm gonna hold up a little sample. Uh, this is a combination of tan and green filament in, uh, in the current system. Um, and one thing to note is the material is reversible, so it couldn't be installed with either side facing up. One thing to <clears throat> remember and pay attention to is you will see a color difference between the two sides. So we call this side our tan side to the windscreen, and this would be our green side. Um, I'll show some pictures later, which um, will show you that color difference, um, but <clears throat> the material can be installed either side facing up. Um, just like your lining systems, the rolls are shipped to your job site. Um, they're in roll form, 10 feet long and a foot and a half in diameter, weighing approximately 325 pounds per roll. That roll material is C folded, so you would unroll the roll and open it up, forming a panel 328 feet in length by 20 feet in width. Um, all those panels are sewn together, so when your installation contractor starts uh, the install, They'll deploy about two or three panels at a time. Um, so using your handheld sewing machine, uh, a prayer seam in the material, and then they will actually hand tension the system into place. Um, you'll continue on with that process, two to three panels at a time, and consistently work um, all of the slack out of the material through your installation. Um, one thing I think that's often overlooked a lot with geosynthetics in general, um, when it comes to sewing materials together, is the type of thread that we're specifying or requiring uh, the installation contractors to use. Um, so for the windscreen systems, we recommend a 277 polyester bonded thread. Uh, it's just a little bit thicker than your traditional thread you would use to sew a geotextile together, uh, which is a 207. Um, this just helps with the durability um, and the service life of the thread. Uh, for installations that are gonna be out uh, exposed for seven, Greater than seven years, I would say we'd recommend a PTFE thread, uh, which is one of the few threads we've found that actually provides a lifetime warranty. Um, it's used a lot in the awning and marine industries for really long-term exposed applications. Uh, it does come out with a, a higher price tag, approximately five to six times um, the price of your traditional polyester thread. Uh, when installing the windscreen systems, I like to put this uh, ballast system detail on the top right. Uh, I've finished a few of these presentations and have been asked the question, um, how does your windscreen system stop infiltration of water? So again, the windscreen system goes on top of your membrane. Your membrane is on top of your subgrade. The windscreen system is acting as the ballast system. Um, when you're making that prayer seam on site, it's important to have uh, efficient or sufficient overlap. So we'd like to see at least three inches of material above your thread line. 
Um, when you don't come, when you don't get the three inches in overlap, sometimes you will see some seam separation um, due to that insufficient overlap. Uh, when terminating, terminating the windscreen systems, wherever possible, we'd always recommend putting it in an anchor trench. Um, a two foot by two foot anchor trench directly on top of the membrane, both products can go uh, in the same anchor trench. Um, that's always not available, so it's site specific. Certain areas would require different means for terminating the windscreen. So in the top right, um, you can see a toe slope termination where essentially what we've done is encapsulated a row of a continuous row of sandbags inside the wind defender material. Um, that system <clears throat> can be installed using pipes, chains, um, grout filled HDPE pipe. We've had a lot of different um, products used uh, and encapsulated in the windscreen systems. Um, so you can kind of be creative with uh, how to terminate. So here's a short video showing the windscreen system installed over a traditional 40 mil LL DPE membrane. You can see it's pretty still on that side. The camera is going to pan to the opposite side of, of the slope where you're going to see a 40 mil LL DPE um, exposed with no ballast system. So just kind of give you an idea of the effects of the wind uplift. That liner is approximately three to four feet off of the subgrade at that point in time. Um, you know, and if, if that ever does uh, fail, it can cause some serious damage, not only to the people that are out there on the site, but any uh, property um, surrounding the area. In addition, um, <clears throat> to its function, the, the system can be reused in certain applications. Um, so you can see here, it's a, just a short video of an installation contractor getting pretty creative um, and installed a uh, auger attachment on the front of a skid steer, um, utilizing a piece of PVC as a core pipe. Um, they're able to take three panels in width of the wind defender at one time. So you're having 60 feet wide of material um, which can be folded in on each other and then rolled up. Um, that's the finished, re-rolled, um, reused material. Um, so just a couple of site photos I wanted to share and some kind of project highlights. Um, right here is a, one of the earliest installations of, the, of a windscreen system. Uh, it was first installed using a traditional rope and sandbag. Um, this is a 12 mil woven coated membrane um, and you can see that essentially the top half of this insulation was uh, blown off in the wind. Um, what happened was your rope lines degraded and slid down the slope leaving the top half of this insulation exposed. So the repair was done to the membrane and the windscreen system was installed over top. Uh, this is an aerial that shows Two separate seven acre um, installations, 40 mil on each side, um, but kind of a unique facility in Kentucky. Uh, this site uh, was essentially trying to procure funds in order to do a final closure. Um, they didn't have the money at the time to import all the soil needed for the full 14 acre closure. So what they did was in 2014, installed the first seven acres of 40 mil. Um, utilizing a rope and sandbag system. And then in 2015, came back and installed the second seven acres of 40 mil along with our windscreen system. Um, basically what this did was it bought the site two years um, to procure the funds necessary to import all the soil for the final closure system. Um, this was a facility, um, those last few photos where you saw the windscreen being reused. Um, this site actually took the material off and shipped it to another a job site where the material was reused. Um, as I said, so we had this a standard green color. This is our tan green version of the windscreen system. Um, just another cell rain cover application, very steep slopes, um, issues with pushing protective, protective cover up the slope and getting it to stay and not erode. Um, a lot of the erosion, uh, this is a, Insulation in Canada or in California, 
a lot of the erosion is caused by wind. Um, so another means for protecting the underlying um, geocomposite and uh, wind erosion. Uh, this is a 300,000 square foot installation uh, over top of a 40 mil. Um, it's kind of a neat application. Um, this would be a, an area where a leachate evaporation system would be installed. Um, so essentially this was a spray curtain to control any overspray from the leachate evaporation system. So whatever didn't evaporate in the air fell back down onto uh, your contained area and was recirculated. Um, project size over time has, has grown. Um, so you're looking at approximately a 30 acre temporary cover in this application. Again, this was uh, a facility wasn't sure if they were going to do final closure at this time or not, so they decided to go with a 40 mil um, LL membrane um, in, in expectations that uh, they could possibly turn this into a final closure. Uh, one thing to note, uh, the windscreen in this uh, installation is only held down um, by the sandbag burrito termination. Um, so the entire 30 acres is held down with a perimeter burrito wrap. Um, Besides that, the only thing that's adding any kind of additional surcharge to the system would be this access road that you see going across the top. Um, so definitely can get pretty creative um, in your termination and effective. Uh, this is kind of a, a new application for the windscreen system, uh, first of its kind, but uh, you're looking at a power plant uh, application with a series of water processing ponds. Um, essentially what the initial design called for was 15 inches of riprap, you know, your textile layer, a foot of cover, granular material, and another textile. This was all supposed to be placed on top of your base um, 60 mil membrane as a means for ballast and UV protection. Um, so the client approached us and asked, is there another way we can ballast this uh, ballast the slopes of our pond and provide the, the uh, required UV protection. We came up with a design which uh, utilized a 24 mil reinforced membrane and um, the knitted windscreen on top. Um, so the anchor trench was utilized at the top of the slope, but we needed a way to terminate at the toe of slope. So the base 60 mil liner um, would receive a cap strip essentially, about two foot wide strip. Um, the, a 30 mil would be extrusion welded to that strip, and then those materials would all be sewn together to that 30 mil flat. So here's a photo of the installation of the toe of slope termination. Um, so when the installation company first got out on site, um, they were cutting all of these strips by hand and installing everything, you know, essentially fabricating this on, on site. Um, this same design was implemented on another three or four facilities and <clears throat> from the time of the first installation now all of these um, cap strip details have been prefabricated um, in a factory and shipped directly to the job site. So definitely saving some time on extrusion welding and cutting and, and dealing with that in the field saves a lot of time. So there's just your after photo. Um, you know, your primary um, basins and holding basins didn't, they received some concrete on the floor, so the windscreen system did not extend across the floor, but the secondary basin, um, approximately 500,000 square feet in size, um, used that windscreen system not only on the slopes, but across the floor. Um, so as I said, installations uh, with the windscreen system have been growing in popularity and in size. Um, so the largest to date is a 3.8 million square foot installation, uh, still under construction. Uh, but this is a great photo to um, show you the difference in the color of the material. So as I said before, um, if you don't keep the same side facing up consistently throughout the installation, you will see some color change. So you know you can see the tan green side of the system versus you know your your green um, side of the system. Um, definitely something to keep in mind. Um, uh, for aesthetic value. 
So in conclusion, uh, I think the, the industry is definitely moving towards the use of exposed membrane cover systems um, more and more frequently. Uh, these cover systems uh, uh, provide a lot of benefits to the, to the landfills, to the clients, uh, to the owners. Um, and I think it's really important that we all try and you know, keep safety in mind, um, analyze the use of prefabricated membranes. Um, you know, they might not make sense in every application, but uh, for steep installations or, or areas that are very difficult to get in and maneuver, um, prefabrication could be a great option. Um, so when you're looking at ballasting these applications, keep in mind, you know, the, your, your maintenance, um, your life expectancy, and the other factors uh, when, when you're choosing which ballast system um, is the best fit for your application. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, Tim, I believe, is taking over at this time. Okay, great. Thanks, Elliot. And that's correct. You can contact Elliot here with this information or myself or Jen Miller, who's the coordinator of the Fabricated Geomembrane Institute. So Elliot, if you advance the next slide. So our, our October webinar is lightweight aggregates for civil engineering applications. And Archie Hillshill will be our speaker there. And the last slide before I go to questions is, Elliot, okay, is uh, please check out the FGI's website. There's a lot of information there. One interesting new feature is the online PDH program. So if you need PDH credits, you can watch some of our prior 14 webinars and watch the webinar and then the system will send you a PDH letter for watching that webinar. Uh, specifications, guidelines are there, detailed drawings, technical papers, um, oh, videos on ASTM laboratory and field test methods if you're interested in performing some geosynthetics testing. Okay, so thank you, Elliot. I have a bunch of questions here. I'm going to start at the top. Um, how about a deer walking on it and damaging the material? Is that a possibility with the knitted ge geotextile? Yeah, that, that definitely is a possibility. We've seen it um, on several facilities. Um, I guess one thing I didn't mention, with the windscreen systems, um, the way that the filaments are knitted together, it provides a lock stitch. So any holes that are created in the system won't propagate. Um, they won't have that zippering effect. Um, they will be contained to the hole size that they are initially. Um, Small holes in the system haven't, you know, been an issue in terms of performance, um, but they can be repaired very easily. Um, essentially, what you would do would just cut out um, a larger hole in that area, um, you know, large enough to actually install it, install a patch, and sew in a patch into that hole. Okay, and that's um, is that hand sewn or like the seaming or sewing device that you showed in one of the slides? Yeah, it would be with the handheld sewing machine that was in my previous slide. Yeah, okay. Okay, um, next, actually there are a couple of questions. Can I get the slides in a PDF to my personal email? Uh, the answer is yes, if you send Jen Miller a email message so she knows who, who to send it to. Otherwise, the PDF and the video will be on the FGI website. Next up is how does the knitted HDPE geotextile perform compared to typical geotextiles in mi minimizing thermal expansion and cooling of the underlying geomembrane. In other words, could you order a heavy enough non-woven geotextile to not only UV protect the underlying geomembrane, but also provide this slope protection? Um, so what makes a knitted geotextile different, um, you know, it is a HDPE textile, so it's UV stabilized. Um, it's gonna not degrade over time. Um, but I guess the, the, the main question is what kind of UV protection would it provide in, in terms of cooling to the underlying membrane? Um, the knitted, uh, windscreen textile is a 60% UV blocking system. 
So when it's used in conjunction with certain liner from certain manufacturers, it'll actually extend their manufacturer's warranty if the windscreen system is used over top. Um, if in comparison to other traditional geotextiles, um, I think you know the big issue with the traditional geotextiles is going to be the the lifespan and the and the quick UV degradation of those materials. Yep. Um, next question is: Have UV tests been conducted on the knitting knitted geotextile, for example, xenon arc or fluorescent lamp? If so, what are the durations that the knitted geotextile has been able to undergo? So um, we did accelerated UV testing um, for a period of 16 months. Um, essentially what they would do is uh, every quarter um, cut a sample um, which was exposed to um, intense light, um, moisture, uh, simulating Arizona's climate. Um, and then the, you know, the, the values from that were then extrapolated and um, produced the curve, which would show you the, you know, expected lifespan of the material. So um, our tests that we've done so far show a 50 year, uh, 55 year half-life and a expected a 90 year expected service life to our system. Okay, 55 years. So that, this is my question, Elliot. <laughs> so, so is there a, a warranty then? Is it, is it 55 years or have, on just UV, not physical damage? Right, so the warranty that uh, we offer is a 10 year um, exposed okay. warranty. Okay, all right, good. Um, next is, um, okay, so this is a, installer of geosynthetics we see a lot of ballast designs and they often seem excessive what design parameters can we or can you recommend elliot that they can suggest to either the engineer or the qc people such that the ballast is reasonable tubes or a reasonable sandbags or some other ballast option what, what would be sort of reasonable parameters? Um, so parameters, I guess with the, with the traditional rope and sandbag systems, I guess reasonable parameters, um, I would say many of the installations and the specifications that I see um, often default to a typical 10 by 10 or five by 10 rope and sandbag grid. Um, I've had a few, a few engineers actually do wind uplift calculations um, for for me to review just to see how that uh, calculation is is done, how they analyze, how they make their assumptions. Um, and I think a lot of times when those, um, when you run the numbers, it actually comes out with a more frequently spaced sandbag de deployment. So, you know, every two to three feet. Um, and I think you know, some assumptions are made just to, for the sake of, um, I guess, what's practical in the field. Um, so I hope I'm answering the question and, and what design parameters. Uh, I'm not sure I, I know how to answer that question any better. Okay. But that gave me uh, an idea, Elliot. If you have done some typical calculations, maybe you and I can work together to put like a one or two page calculation sheet on the FGI website, and then people could take their wind speed and their slope angle and so on and plug it in and see what they get. So sure. let's work on that. Second is you said a five by five layout. So what does that mean? That would be five feet down slope of the prior bag and then five feet over or what's five yeah. by five? Yeah, so it's either um, most of the traditional rope and sandbag um, systems are five by 10 or 10 by 10. So essentially it just means a one sandbag every, if it's a 10 by 10, every 100 square feet. So every 100 square feet, there's a, a sandbag. Um, and if it's a five by 10, every 50 square feet, there's a sandbag. Um, they can be spaced differently. Some, some engineering, um, some engineering folks like to have rope lines both vertically and horizontally on every bag. Others um, 
will take a less um, frequency in the uh, rope lines when it's running horizontally because um, those horizontal rope lines are really in place to stop the vertical rope lines from shifting side to side. <clears throat> yep. Uh, okay, uh, here's another one. Um, yeah, so actually this gets to what I just talked about. Do you have a recommended calculation method to determine the wind load? So maybe this is a second question along there, so maybe we should produce some calculation pages, but how do you estimate wind loads? Um, so I, the engineering uh, community is what, who is really doing the estimating on the wind loads. Um, they typically use JP Giroud's methods for um, determining uplift forces and how to counteract those forces. Okay. And actually, well, Elliot, that'd be great. If you know that paper, uh, I'll get a PDF of it, PDF of it, and we'll add it to our website where the video will be housed so people can download the design method. But again, okay. I need to put some sample counts up. Um, let me see. There's... Um, uh, I think we've... Okay, when using HDPE, and I don't know what that means, whether it's uh, for the protection or the, actually the geomembrane, what determines the me material you use for the ballast system or weight system? We t sometimes use a tube instead of the traditional sandbag. Mm -hmm. um, I really think that comes down to the owner's or engineer's preference. Um, I see a lot of sand tubes um, utilized in a lot of basin applications. Um, so I, I, I really believe it just comes down to the, to the desire of your client um, and your engineer. But uh, in my experience, I've seen a lot more sand tubes and ballast tubes being used in basin uh, or lagoon applications and, you know, your rope and sandbag systems, um, windscreen systems are used a lot more in, um, you know, your uh, slope uh, capping applications or cell rain cover applications. Okay. Uh, another question, have installers utilized a wedge welding machine uh, for seaming the knitted geotextile in, instead of um, the sewing? Um, that's something that we've been um, experimenting with uh, since we formed the company. Uh, we haven't been able to really come up with a, a, a solid way to wedge weld in the field um, just with the inconsistency, uh, you know, with the pores in the textile, it's really hard to get a, um, a solid weld on the material um, without weakening it too much. Um, so we found up until this point, you know, uh, prayer seaming has been the most effective. Okay. Another question, different question. Do you have any suggestions for providing access to gas extraction wells with the knitted geotextile, um, especially on steep slopes? Um, yeah, that's been, uh, you know, a common um, question, I guess, is the short answer is uh, we've been experimenting with some different products, um, currently using a um, a treadway product, uh, uh, which is made out of PVC that we, um, are doing some experiments right now. We have, we just installed on a facility two weeks ago. Um, so we're going to get some feedback from that facility to see how it's working and how it's performing. Um, I know the, the windscreen systems and the liner systems are pretty slick to walk on, on side slopes, um, right. especially with any condensation, um, you know, it's definitely going to be very slippery. Uh, so hopefully this, this system that we installed does help. I think no matter what with condensation or dust, and it, uh, I'm not sure if there is an, uh, a foolproof answer out there to um, reduce the amount of um, slips and on site. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Another question related to landfill gas. How do you recommend managing landfill gas pressures under the geomembrane? So on the underside of the geomembrane with the either 
sand ballast or uh, windscreen on the top of the geomembrane? Um, sure. So uh, there's different techniques I've seen sites use, um, different things from pressure relief valves, which are actually built into your lining system itself, um, which can be set to, you know, off gas at a certain amount of pressure buildup. Um, other methods have been using strips of composite. Um, there's some other systems that I won't use by call by by name, but um, they can also be installed underneath your um, lining system. Back um, tubes can be connected to laterals uh, at the top of the slope or headers, so vacuum could actually be drawn on the surface. Um, so there's definitely a lot of different options to combat the, you know, the surface gas and um, prevent that gas uplift. Okay, um, let's see, uh, HPE, uh, we sort of had one like that already. Uh, all right, I think, uh, I think I've covered most of them, Elliot, so anything you want to wrap up with at this point? Um, no, I appreciate everybody's time. Um, I know I went through a little quick there, uh, but if there's anything you know, I can do feel free to send me an email, um, give me a call. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and you can get all my contact information there as well. Um, but yeah, I appreciate everyone's time. Great. So before we end, I want to encourage everyone to visit the FGI and the IGS North America websites. Uh, the FGI is on the screen. The IGS North America website, if you just Google IGS North America, it'll come up. And to learn more about these organizations and to consider joining and becoming involved in, ge in the geosynthetics industry. Thanks in advance for your interest in these groups and for attending today's webinar. So thanks again to Elliot Pugh for sharing his expertise with temporary geosynthetic covers. Thanks and I hope we'll see you in October. Great, thank you everyone.